This this is literally the single most important book that any trader or investor needs to read. It is crucial that you understand the concepts that are in this book. We are brewing great returns, and today we're going to talk about books, guys. All right. Yeah, yeah. I think today we were going to talk about money books, uh, books about investing, and also books about trading. Want to guys go into money books first? Yeah, let's talk about books that are just plain about money. So, how about the billionaire next door? Uh, so, what's that about? It's about basically how you know, like the person that's a millionaire that you would never know is a millionaire because they live very cheap, very frugal, kind of like a lot of us do. Um, that kind of a lifestyle. There's a lot of really good uh, tips and tricks in here. Um, it even talks about how people raise their kids. You know how to how to raise them to. You know, be strong, not just money wise, and, you know, not, not reward bad behavior, reward good behavior, stuff like that. Like, you know, not drive like a BMW, maybe just drive like a Honda Accord, basic stuff. Mm. <clears throat> well, uh, so money book, I have uh, basically this becoming your own banker. Now, it is about life insurance, but if you minus the life insurance po uh, portion of it and just worry about how to manage your money and build your own pool for banking. So for example, if your main source of income is your job and it fills in your, let's say Chase Bank, for example, you try to have other revenue sources to build your own bank. So instead of you being relied on this asset, you have multiple assets. Uh, and then you can supposedly, you know, loan out yourself, loan out money towards yourself off of your own assets. Uh, so the only book about money I was going to talk about is Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is one of the most talked about books in all of all of investing and stuff. Um, <clears throat> I don't actually recommend people go through the process of reading it. Uh, the, the core lesson in there that I think is the most important is the difference between good debt and bad debt. Uh, bad debt is when you buy a depreciating asset, like you go into debt to buy a car. That's that's a horrible idea. Uh, good debt is when you when you take the money and then you buy something that produces cash flow and hopefully appreciates over time, like, say, an apartment complex. And and that is a big part of what uh, Robert Kiyosaki is talking about in that book is uh, if you're going to take out a loan, you had better make sure you spend the money on something that produces cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, and uh, what I like about the book is just the different mindsets. Oh, yeah. What, yeah. The e E B S I or something like that. Well, he he uh, in I don't know how true this is, but in the book he was raised by both a rich dad and a poor dad, and the poor dad was uh, a teacher. He was very well educated, and he just didn't understand um, investing in money very well. And his rich dad was a business guy. He was all like self-taught, and he understood money. and And the difference between the advice that his rich dad gave him versus the advice his poor dad gave him was huge. Mm. Especially in, <clears throat> in today's environment, learning the differences of good debt, bad debt, especially the like, car thing. Yeah, I think more oh, yeah. people, if they pay things out outright or use credit, I'm sorry, use debt properly, they, we wouldn't have, be in such a bad, I'll say, bad state economically. Yeah. Right. A, a huge number of Americans are living beyond their means. Oh, yeah. Uh, so do either of you two have any other books on money that you would just plain about money, not about trading or investing that you wanted to talk about? Well, uh, one that's my only book into crypto. It's that one about the Bitcoin standard talking about how, you know, debt and stuff like that, how the system is dependent on debt. If we want uh, to go. What's the name of the book? Coach? The Bitcoin, uh, thank God for Bitcoin. Thank God for Bitcoin. OK. Yeah. Mm. Really good book. It goes into how uh, the system is massively dependent on mm -hmm consumer debt all types of debt really but we hear mm. a lot of government debt and stuff like that but consumer debt is actually a part of the pie too um and it's very it, th this book details how uh the the debt you know cons consumer debt like funnels the the whole debt spiral situation a, a huge portion of our economy is based off of consumer spending yeah so this book is called actually make sure i got it this is Elliott Waves. So the way, the reason why I like about it for trading, it's not because of Elliott Waves and their system of like, you know, their waves of corrections versus trends. The way I like it is about distribution and finding the cycle of businesses or cycle of like, where's the money's at? So for example, if we're in tech right now, but this money is flowing into energy 
or energy stocks are flowing into commodities. I like fo following things like that. Or the book goes into like different countries. Like, is it the Asian cycle right now? Is it the American cycle? Like following the money in that regards. And it'll help you out, it helps me out for trading. So when I'm looking at what politicians or what they're trying to push, something like this will help you find out the direction that they're going, like long-term. <clears throat> so you're using that for long-term trades? Mm -hmm. Long-term trades. Now it could be done short term, but if you're gonna do it within short term, it has to be has to be well defined. Kind of like a, I see energy going up long term, commodities going up long term, but to me, something short term would be like a few tech stocks. Mm -hmm. But I think long term energy will be is my main goal right now when it comes to stocks. Uh, so when I looked into Elliott Wave a few years ago, I came to the conclusion that it's it's not really good as a predictive model. Uh, but it is very good at identifying, helping you identify accumulation and distribution zones. Yep. Really helpful in that. I mean, there are some key examples that I talk about like how to manage it during trading. If you guys want to use it during trading, this is what you're going to be looking at, stuff like this, different waves. Yep. So if you want to trade like that, I would say it might make things very difficult because if it goes the opposite direction, then now you have a, 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 a was it, elongated waveform. But... <laughs> I think that's it's gonna make trading quite difficult. Is that a euphemism for getting stopped out? Oh yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, I've seen so many models of it, and to me, it just doesn't work. Like when they do it over like 500 years or a thousand years, like hey guys, if you bought wheat and corn during this flow, and I'm like, then yes, it works out. But when it comes to like, hey, Tesla did X Y Z. No, I, I think it's like long term come up. Commodities, commodities work really well with uh, Elliott Waves, in my opinion. Okay. But that's real assets, something that can't be manipulated so much. And uh, my last book, and this is why I use this for trading and why it's like 80% of my portfolio. Like Literally, it's like my entire portfolio is surrounded by these methods. Is uh, It's because of uh, Gold and Silver by Mike Maloney. And this book talks about trading and investments and measuring assets within assets. So, for example... If you what, what I've seen is that people measure things with dollars and not purchasing power. So, for example, if you have if you measure apples with with the with the Dow, for example. So, if the price of the apple was a dollar, but then the apple went up to two dollars, but your stock went up twenty percent. If you measure everything in apples, for example, you actually lost value because that went up double and that one went up twenty percent. So, if you measure things in dollars and you stay in dollars, typically people get blindsided for gains i i have heard uh i'm not sure quite how accurate it is but i've heard from multiple people that uh the cost of buying a home in gold mm -hmm. hasn't really changed very much in the last hundred years i would but say the, this oh, but the dollar value has oh yeah, yeah. the but dollar never... value is what's absolutely crazy and that's why it talks about like i love this book so much like i've read it maybe nearly a hundred times if you can flip to a page i can explain about it and the, the crazy thing about the dollar, and that's why I, I think this is where we all differ so much, it's long-term things. Like for me, I am so anti-dollar, anti-long, like anti-America in that regard. So I, like, I support America, but I don't support the politicians who run America. And the way they have the dollar going, this book here like puts you on track to be like, hey, instead of staying in America, maybe go overseas. Yeah. Mm, but yeah, that's, I'll say this book is the, the best part about it. They have this whole book in a video. Like you can watch the whole book in a, in a I think, 12 part video series. So the first one I have, it's called The Investment Alternative. And it basically talks about <clears throat> life insurance, how life insurance can be an alternative Roth IRA. Like you can mm -hmm. build like a huge tax free account through your cash balance and your life insurance portfolio. And it gets into estate planning and all of that and about how life insurance is a good way to protect your estate and all of that. Um, and basically a good alternative to investing. Um, and you, you said Blake, you think the whole life is better than uh, uh, the, um, uh, the other way around. I, I think whole is um, far less, uh, far less efficient than just index fund investing, mm -hmm. but term life insurance has a lot of appeal. Yeah. And then the other one, this may fall under, well, I have one up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. Um, I was going to talk about that book as well. Yeah. The manager of the Fidelity Magellan uh, famous mutual fund back in the day. Um, 
very, very good book. Um, it's on, on my list to read. I haven't read it yet, so I'll let you talk more about it. Uh, sure, I can start talking about it right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I first got a hold of that book when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, and it has definitely helped me define uh, how to find attractive investments. Um, it's it's about a two-hour read. You can actually get on YouTube right now and type in Peter Lynch went up on Wall Street, and you can listen to the audiobook version of it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it covers uh, all sorts of, of how to do actual real-life market research where you are identifying the quality of a product or service. Uh, so he gives a bunch of examples in there. Um, one of the things that he did was uh, he heard about a, a nylon company that was making really, really high-quality nylons. So he got his wife a pair and then uh, had her wear them two or three times. Mm -hmm. And then he asked her, you know, how are those? Do you like those? Do you want me to buy more of those? Do you want me to buy a different brand? Uh, stuff like that. He, Every time he goes out to lunch, he's not just there for a good meal. He's trying to assess the quality of their meal, the quality yeah. of the product. Is this particular brand of subs a good, a good investment based off of the quality of the product? Now, he also mm -hmm. looked at financials and stuff, too. But uh, it's important to help you identify um, up and coming rising stars within an industry or up and coming industries because uh, they're surrounding you. Uh, the, the one of the core things that he teaches in there is that the average retail investor actually has a huge advantage over the institutions because they're not allowed to buy companies under a certain market cap. And you as a retail investor have the opportunity to invest in high quality business models that are providing really high quality goods and services while they're small, uh, way before the institutions get involved. Um, and, and you are surrounded, <clears throat> you are surrounded by good investments all the time. You just have to actually know how to identify them. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I'll say just uh, identifying a really good thing is just like, like you, like, uh, for example, since we met, uh, since I met up with you guys, you guys have showed me aspects of the market that are completely blind to me. Like mm -hmm. option trading, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, wow, you guys have such, you guys can get a hundred to one and get oh, yeah. paid. I'm like, wow, really? Oh, yeah. That's, so I think a book like that can open up your eyes, you know, open your eyes to other investments or just looking at how to look at other assets. A hundred to one. That's a good Ooh. book. Yeah. So I'm halfway through the my own audiobook version of this. It's really good talking about how I identify companies that return one hundred to one, aka one hundred baggers. Uh, it goes very extensively into Monster Beverage. It talks about Amazon, which Amazon's still rolling. Um, and yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of really good information in this one. Uh, parts three and four are due for my own audiobook. He course. talks about trying to find companies that are run lean. It doesn't cost them very much to expand, mm -hmm. and they generate pretty good returns. Uh, I mean, like cash flow, not not share price returns. The company itself generates an attractive amount of money. Um, and you can look at Amazon. Amazon's a perfect example of that. For many years, uh, nowadays they are net income positive, but for many years they were net income negative, but cash flow positive because they were rolling every available penny into more growth. Mm. Yep. The Bitcoin standard is also a really good read as well. Um, I don't agree with everything in here, but it talks about how Bitcoin could become a viable replacement for the dollar and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Well-reasoned. Um, not saying I agree, but it's definitely worth a good read for sure. Uh, so I have six books on investing I wanted to talk about, and we already brought up Peter Lynch went up on Wall Street, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, the first one that I think everyone should take a look at is John Bogle, The First 50 Years. Uh, he absolutely revolutionized index fund investing. He, he He's the guy that popularized this. And uh, this is the form of investing that a majority of people should get into because it does not require accounting skills. So uh, he identified that the two largest uh, enemies to the common everyday man when it comes to investing are expenses and emotions. And so you just need to find an ultra low expense index fund and that will remove your fear uh, of losing money because, you know, because you're busy investing into the S&P 500 or um, you know, the QQQ or something like that. And, and as long as you take on a long time frame approach and hunt for ETFs with reasonably good returns over longer time frames and lower fees, you're playing a winning game. Uh, it might not necessarily produce the highest returns, but it's virtually guaranteed to not lose money over really long time frames. 
I think that perspective over long time frames, if you put that, if the average person can get that in like purview and like, hey, if I do this for the next 40 years, instead of like, oh, 10 minutes in front of them, the stock yeah. didn't go up. Well, if you start buying the S&P when you're 18 uh, and, and buy more and more of it every year, boy, are you going to be happy when you're 50, 60, 70. You, you are going to see some huge long-term gains uh, out of that. Uh, so far, I think the lowest fees, I think the lowest fees for that is to buy the VU. Uh, the SPY is also an option, but I think this, the fees are higher on the SPY than they are on the VU. So if you want to gain exposure to the S&P 500, uh, I think the VU is the best, the best way to get that done. There are other good index funds that you, that people can get into. Um, the VTI is not too bad. VT is not bad. Uh, the, there's there's a whole slew of them. Um, I started off as an index fund investor when I was like 15. I was like, oh, this is the way. This is how I'm going to do it. And uh, eventually, I switched to in individual stock picking because I decided that I, you know, it, it one it doesn't match my personality. Uh, I'm an engineer. I like to take things apart. The whole adage of where like. You know, why fix it if it's not broken? Well, I, I could make it better. <laughs> and so I have that sort of like obsessive uh, need to tinker and take things apart and figure out how they work. So uh, my personality matches individual stock picking much better than most people. Mm -hmm. um, as far as that goes, I was also going to talk about, uh, I have like four other books on individual stock picking I was going to talk about. Okay. Um, Benjamin Graham, The Intelligent Investor. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I have a copy of it right up here behind me. Uh, I first read that as a teenager a few months ago. I decided to give it a second reread. Um, it is very dry. It is very long, but it is often referred to as the Bible of investing. It covers a huge, wide range of topics. Um, the two most important ones in there are the concept of Mr. Market and how to, how to find valuations on stuff. Uh, so the concept with Mr. Market is uh, imagine if when you buy a company, um, you can conglomerate all of the other shareholders into a single person. This single person is referred to as Mr. Market. Every day he shows up, he knocks on your door, he asks you if you want to sell. And every day he gives you a new price. And often the today's price is fairly similar to yesterday's price. And also often he's very irrational. So you have the decision of whether or not you are selling your shares to Mr. Market today. And uh, the general lesson is that you buy, you buy when he's irrationally trying to sell you shares when they're cheap. And you sell back to him when he's being irrational in the other direction and the shares are overvalued. Uh, the other concept is how to, how to like actually value a company based on their cash flows. Uh, and they talk a lot about like discounted cash flow analysis and the time value of money. Uh, there's also a, a, several chapters on bonds, how, how and why bonds move the way that they do. <clears throat> and that, that, that is a big lesson that the reason I reread that is because the bond market had tanked and the, the value of the bonds had gone down dramatically, but the yield that they were producing went up dramatically. And I was all like, oh man, I remember this from when I read The Intelligent Investor as a teenager. And so I, I got a hold of a, a, a fresh new copy and decided to reread the chapters on bonds so that it would be fresh in my mind again. It is a fantastic read. I recommend everybody who wants to get into portfolio theory or, or just generic non-index fund investing, give the intelligent investor a try. Yep. Uh, the next one I was going to talk about um, is The Dondo Investor by Manish Pabrai. And I, I have that one right up here. It's right in between the John, the blue John Bogle book and the red intelligent investor book that's the dondo investor um so the core lesson from that book uh, he told he teaches you how to like examine a business model and you look for unfair competitive advantage you look for like companies that are just plain doing something that the other companies are incapable of doing and, and it needs to be pretty unfair it needs to be like watching mike tyson beat up a teenager you know it, <laughs> it needs to be pretty clear that there's some sort of unfairness going on. And uh, this helps you identify uh, low risk, high reward situations. So uh, Wall Street will often get confused between uncertainty and risk. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a lot of uncertainty uh, with, a, with a company's future, they will devalue it way down in the gutter. And that actually produces a situation where your risk is very low because the share price is very low. And as soon as that uncertainty ends, regardless of how it's resolved, um, 
it, it could theoretically produce pretty significant gains. So the phrase that Monish uses is uh, heads I win, tails I don't lose much. And so he looks for, he hunts for these high risk, uh, sorry, high re low risk, high reward situations. Uh, and, and that book will help you, guide you to find those. Uh, it is a fantastic read. It is, it is probably the single best book on investing that I've read as an adult. Uh, it, it's, it's real powerful lessons in there. Uh, it is not, it is not for someone who's never been involved in markets. It is also not for someone who cannot read uh, financial statements. So, so sit down and teach yourself accounting first. Otherwise, half of what he's talking about is not going to make as much sense as it should. Yeah. Uh, I was also going to talk about, um, I'm in, actually in the middle of reading this right now. I'm only about a third of the way through it. The Little Book of Valuation. It's by a guy named Aswath Damodaran. Pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it teaches you a whole bunch of different ways to value companies, how to value growth stocks, how to value uh, well-established, mature companies, all that stuff. He teaches you several methods. Uh, I'm only like a third of the way through it. So, so far, it's a, been a fantastic read. Uh, I picked it up a few weeks ago, and I've just been reading through it in my free time. Uh, he, he, is, uh, he has gone down in history as one of the better educators. Uh, he teaches at, I think, one of the Ivy League schools or something. You guys can look him up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, and then the last book that I recommend that every individual stock picker reads is Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Oh, uh, I have Sun Tzu, too. I oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For a hundred percent. If if Monish Babrai will teach you how to identify unfair, unfair business models, The Art of War will really expand on that. Um, yeah. I've read it every year since I was 11, uh, usually the week of my birthday. Nice. It's not a very long read. It takes, you know, like an hour and a half or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I originally I started reading it because I'm obsessed with strategy games and it was going to give me a one up on everything from like risk to poker to Magic the Gathering to Warhammer 40K. All mm -hmm. of the strategy games that I love playing, mm -hmm. um, it will help you identify opportunity. It'll help you clearly identify edge mm -hmm. and then you can come up, you can modify your strategy to help uh, monopolize on that edge. Great. Ah, oh, okay, I see. That book is old. Oh, it's it's a little old. Yeah, definitely. Andre, if you've never read The Art of War, mm. give it a read. I just, looked, I just think that I'm like, oh, it's an interesting Art of War. Just like just that, just the name of that title. Like, so. Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's all from, like strategy and stuff. Yeah, it's yes. it's from the Warring States period of China, so it's yeah. like well over a thousand years old. Sun Tzu, right? So, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Yeah. 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 So the the first person that I recommend all new traders take a look at, his name is Mark Douglas. Uh, he came out with a book called Trading in the Zone. It's all about trading psychology. Uh, the the hedge funds uh, used to send, like if they had a trader that was hitting a, a losing streak, they would put him on a plane and send him to go spend a day listening to Mark, Mark Douglas talk. Mm -hmm. This guy was giving seminars out, and it would it would cost like seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a day to attend one of his seminars. Um, nowadays, uh, we're all lucky; you can find them on YouTube. So just get on YouTube, type in Mark Douglas seminar. It, they're like four or five hours long. They're all about the psychology of trading, and they are they are one of the better things that you could ever listen to if you want to get into trading, day trading, swing trading, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of him, Andre? I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, look up Mark Douglas. Uh, and he's great to listen to like while you're working out or something. Uh, it, there's like no charts. There's no tables or graphs to read. It's just him explaining the type of mindset that you yeah. need to be in if you're going to be a successful trader. You have to trade while you're like neutral. You, you can't be, you cannot be uh, in a euphoric state of mind because when you're euphoric, you are unable to recognize risk. Yeah. Uh, and then the same with if you're if you're dealing with fear, if you if you're trading from a fear perspective, you are unable to properly identify opportunity. Wow. So you have to trade while you're level headed. And I know, Andre, you don't have this big of a problem because you automate almost everything. Yeah, I mean, but, this is uh, I had that issue a long time ago. Like, yeah. When you were manually trading, you were dealing yeah. with fear and euphoria every day. Mm -hmm. right. It's constant. It's actually really annoying, too. Like, oh, uh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, uh, is this stock going to do good or bad? 
or like even when you look at the numbers, you break it down saying this is like a say an eight out of ten. So it should do it should perform pretty good, but it still takes some long, so it still takes time. Uh, actually, there is one book that I have about automation. Maybe I can talk about that for trading. Sure, sure. Um, I have four other trading books to talk about, but you're welcome to talk about automation first. There you go. This is uh, if you're for people who program and people who are very boring. This is the book is for you. Now, when I mean boring, I mean this is the type of stuff it is. Is this code? What like language? MQL4. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this book will teach you. It doesn't teach you. It will help you with automation, understanding why people automate. And for me, like the reason why I, I like looking at a lot of markets. I'm talking about like hundreds of markets all at once, and getting a simple report. And these are based on the algorithms, and this book will help you out. So it is a, it's not a, per se a trading book, but it can improve your trading to get you into automated everything to basically automating everything. And uh, it will help with the emotions because you don't even use it. You know, you don't even have that problem. Oh, man. Uh, so the next two trading books I was going to talk about are they're both on basically the same topic. They're on volume profile. Uh, the volume profile was invented in the. 1950s by a pair of guys. One of them is named James Dalton and the other one is J. Peter Stittlemeyer. And uh, James Dalton wrote a book called Mind Over Markets. It's uh, over. It's this one here. That's the one you told me about. I bought it. Actually. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's like 400 pages. It is super dry. Uh, it, is, it is, I believe, the driest book I have ever read. And, and I'm an engineer, so I read dry books like all the time. <laughs> driest book ever um but it's full yeah. of really solid really good information uh it's yeah. it, it it explains a little bit about how market makers move the markets how they trade on half an hour time frames um uh, mm -hmm. the, like they're busy what's what's it called they're they're busy uh taking both sides and they're grid trading and every half an hour they try to fix their inventory and so if you can identify when an inventory fix happens that that's an edge that you can play into um, the other book <clears throat> is by J. Peter Stittlemeyer. It uses the exact same technology. I, I can never remember. One of these guys was a range trader and the other one was a momentum trader. Uh, but they were both using the same technology that they developed. Uh, one day, one of them was in his office and a mailboy comes by and drops off some lunch or some mail or something like that. And they're like, oh, you're working on the same stuff that guy up on the fifth floor is working on. And he's like, what? And then they, uh -huh. they go up and they meet. And this is sort of like how calculus was invented in two different places at the same time by both Leibniz and Newton. These wow. two guys were working in literally the same building. Uh, and they were both working on looking at markets where the volume is on the y-axis instead of the x-axis. And it tells you just so much more information. Um, so the second book is only 200 pages. It is also pretty dry. <laughs> it's not quite as dry as this one. But it is also pretty dry. Um, they, they both talk a lot about um, auction theory and the auction process. Uh, mm -hmm. Those were the two books that reading those made it super clear to me that uh, markets are not efficient. They're auction driven. Um, and both of those books, uh, they're very good for both day traders and swing traders. I would say if you want to get into day trading, this one is a little bit better. And this one is a little bit better for swing trading. They're both really good reads. Um, the next trading book I want to talk about is Jesse Livermore's How to Trade in Stocks. Uh, so have you have either of you heard of Jesse Livermore before? Or you just, told me about him. It was I he the guy, him. the San Francisco earthquake and yeah. all of that. That yeah. was him. Yeah. Th that was him. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this guy started off. Uh, Andre's looking him up right now. Yeah. This, this guy started off uh, like he grew up in the rural parts, uh, rural areas in New England. And uh, he got a job as a chalk boy in a bucket shop. So what a bucket shop is, is you would walk in off the street and place a bet on a stock and they would just take the other side of your trade without actually calling a broker. And they, they did this. Yeah. Andre makes a face. They did this because they know that the general public really sucks at trading. Yeah. And if for whatever reason um, you end up being really up or really down on a position and the bucket shop is going to lose money, that is when they call a broker and they put in an, a huge order in the other direction and they force you to get stopped out of your trade. And so the bucket, yeah, you're making a face. The bucket shops were made illegal by the SEC um, when they were formed. And so the, we don't really honestly have bucket shops anymore. If you want to insult a broker, you tell him he works at a bucket shop. 
<laughs> it, it, is, it is like it is like the worst thing you can ever call a broker. <laughs> it's mm. like you and your bucket shop over there. It, it is like spitting in his face. Um, so mm. Jesse Livermore, at, at one point, he was the richest man on the planet. Uh, and I'm talking he had more money than J.P. Morgan. He had and, and they lived at the same time. There were there was uh, instances where people such as J.P. Morgan would call him and ask him to get out of a trade. So, like, for example, J.P. Morgan would buy, you know, millions of dollars worth of stuff when the shares were at one hundred dollars. And then uh, like six months later, instead of going up, now it's trading at like eighty five. And he calls up Jesse Livermore and he says, hey, if you can get me out of this position for not a loss, I will pay you a certain amount. And uh, the reason why Jesse Livermore was notorious for being able to do that mm-hmm. is because he was really good at manipulating markets on a large scale. So, so the last book I want to talk about is by a guy named Edwin Lafarve, and he followed Jesse Livermore around near the end of his life. And uh, it's called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. And this, this is literally the single most important book that any trader or investor needs to read. It is crucial that you understand the concepts that are in this book. So um, Jesse Livermore, the reason J.P. Morgan was calling him up and asking him to get out of positions and stuff like that is because uh, Jesse Livermore figured out how to fake a bull run. Mm. And so he would call up like like on day one, he would call up two brokers and on one broker, he would ask them to buy a thousand, 10,000 shares. And then the other broker, he would ask them to sell 10,000 shares. And then on the open market, he would walk the price up. So he, he would buy some at the ask repeatedly until the price rose a little bit. On day two, he would call up four brokers, 20,000 shares long, 20,000 shares short, walk the price up further. On day three, he'd call up eight brokers, 80,000 long, 80,000, you know, he just kept doubling up every time. So what retail would see, and and by the way, um, Mm. this book teaches you to chase that. This book was sold to retail. Reminiscences of of a stock operator, operator teaches you how to hose people who were using this book. Mm-hmm. So this is the book he sold to the masses. The other book is talking about how he hosed people. Um, so he could fake bull runs. He could force a short squeeze. Uh, mm. He could do all sorts of crazy things that um, the SEC had to be formed because of Jesse Livermore. So if you want to know why we went ahead and started regulating things is because people were capable of moving markets really hard, uh, you know, like 120, 130 years ago, stuff like yeah. that. Uh, you brought up the the railroad, uh, the earthquake, the San Francisco earthquake. Yeah. yeah. So he heard uh, through the telegraph that there had been an earthquake in San Francisco, but no one knew on the East Coast how bad it was. So he went and he was on I think he was on vacation at the time. Uh, he was at the beach and he walked to the, the, the sending a signal to his broker to short a railroad on the West Coast. And he made a million dollars in a day uh, just off of that short. Uh, and so it, like it, the, the amount of things that he is capable of doing or was capable of doing 100 years ago is just astounding. And he talks about he talks about how to manipulate a market in there. He talks about how to identify if a market is being manipulated. Oh. The reminiscences of a stock operator is is literally the single most important book that I recommend everyone read. Uh, especially if you're going to participate in markets, either as a trader or as an investor, mm-hmm. because uh, it it is the playbook that big money still uses today. If you're a whale and you want to move a market, that's the that's the playbook. It's all in there. The whole first half of the book is uh, it's it's a talking about his life, like growing up, what he did, what he didn't do, things that worked well for him, things that didn't. He was the world's first quant trader. So while everyone else around him was trying to understand markets through through technical analysis, um, so he figured out that if he got a hot tip, that like say he got a hot tip, J.P. Morgan was buying this one company really heavy. Mm-hmm. So instead of just buying, he would test that theory by shorting into it to see how much the share price went down and if it didn't go down hardly at all if those shares just got absorbed then he knew that there was a whale buying and he could he could safely go long so he would cover his short and then he would go long and so he he was yeah he was the first quant trader that ever existed as far as anyone can tell Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all of his antics are in that book so the first half is about his his learning experiences and his life and the second half of that book is just a long series of all these amazing trades that he did. 
Uh, it, it is it is Andre. It's a must read for you. I know it. Uh, you you are constantly talking about whales moving markets and big money moving markets, investment banks, hedge funds, all that stuff. That's their playbook. That that is what they use. And I'm sure they have developed additional strategies since then. But that book contains uh, the core thesis of how to do it. You said Edwin Lefe. Yeah, Edwin uh, L E F E V R E. And uh, oh, it's, it was it was written by him, but it was about Jesse Livermore. Another book to try out. Oh, it's it's well worth. You can listen to it like while you're working out or something. There's like no charts in there. You you won't miss. There's no tables to miss or anything like that. It's just an audio. It, it's great to absorb as an audio book. Yes. Uh, there's and as a recap, the two books again were titled what? Uh, Jesse Livermore, How to Trade in Stocks. Mm -hmm. And Ed, Edwin Lafarva, I'm I'm horrible at French. Reminiscences of a stock operator. Okay. All of you guys have a great night. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, we'll see you again shortly. Thanks, everyone.